We have a church that I believe with all my heart wants to be intentional. Wants to be intentional. And I'm just, I've grown so much listening to the worship committee as, as we talk through the upcoming church services. And we had Dave Nelson come on board, uh, who's in charge of our children's church. We meet once a month. And he said, I want to see more children in ch- in, inside of church. And so we've, uh, we've decided to, uh, to make sure that we have more children involved in the main church service. After all, that's what children's church is all about, is training our children to be active, involved, worshiping their God. Amen? Kind of goes into what I'm talking about today. It has nothing to do with luck. So my title this morning is, What's Luck Got to Do With It? What's luck got to do with it? I've had the privilege uh, for a couple weeks now. I go to the gym with Pastor Jackie some days. Uh, you know, we're not, we're not stuck to the schedule because sometimes something will come up. But we find ourselves playing racquetball. I don't know if you've ever played racquetball, but it's, it's a fast-moving sport. You have a, it's like tennis, but you hit this ball, and basically wherever the ball bounces off of, you have to run and get it before it hits the ground once. And, and so you find yourself running all over the place. And, um, and so one day we were there, and now we're to the point where we're kind of even. And so it's like the score is even, and we're working hard. And, and so any, anyway, one day, one of the, uh, one of the uh, more, more senior citizens that joined the gym came to us, and he said, would you mind if I played racquetball with the two of you? And I'm thinking to myself, oh, Jackie. We're going to have to go easy on this one. You know, let's take it easy. You know, the last thing we need him to do is get hurt on our, in our game. And, and so we're kind of talking. He's getting ready. He sits down, and he starts wrapping this knee. And I'm thinking, oh, boy, he's going to break. And then he starts wrapping this knee. He's putting all these wraps on, and then he put his ankle braces on, and then he put an elbow thing, and I'm thinking, oh, my. So Jackie and I, we're talking, okay, we're walking to the court. And we're like, let's just go easy, go easy. Let's just go easy on him, all right? So we get in there, and we even say, Sir, why don't you go first? Why don't you serve? So he starts, and we never got a chance to serve after that. <laughs> you know, I think they use the term, we got schooled. <laughs> Do not judge a book by its cover. And uh, this, this gentleman played for so long and so well, that usually the ball will bounce high off the seat. He was keeping it like an inch from the ground. And what are you supposed to do with that? I mean, it hits the ground, and that's a point. And so we leave there, and I'm thinking to Jackie, and I'm thinking to myself, better luck next time. Better luck next time for myself. Well, this morning I want to really talk about, really this is the second part of, um, the last time I spoke with you was at, at the end of the month, last month, and uh, I used, we used the topic of the untouchable becoming touchable. We were talking about God, His holiness, and everything He brings when He comes and meets with His people. And so this morning, it's the second part of that. And I want to tell you, luck has nothing to do with how Jesus came to this earth. The Bible says that He had a plan before the foundations of the earth were laid. He had a plan. And there are prophecies that the Bible has talked about that, that prove that the Messiah would come. Matter of fact, the whole Old Testament sanctuary service is pointing towards who? Jesus. So really quickly, before we get into um, the probability, let's just quickly go into the old sanctuary service. The moment somebody came into the sanctuary service in the wilderness, they entered, how many doors was there? One door. How are we saved? One way. By Jesus Christ. And so they entered the sanctuary service. Their back was towards the what? The east, the sun. And it was because back then people used to worship the sun. And so this was a way that God was very intentional about every single thing that was laid out in the sanctuary service. And so they would enter. The, the, the priest would enter. They would take the lamb. All right, now, that's not a trick question. Who does the lamb represent? Jesus, the lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. John the Baptist was prophesying about him when Jesus came. He said, behold, the lamb of God that takes away the sins 
of the world. And so the moment you walk into the sanctuary, you have the, the, uh, the, first, the first thing. By the way, if you want to follow along, it's uh, you know, around Exodus 25, we start to unveil the, the tabernacle setting. By the way, this is a type of, where is the actual sanctuary? Heaven. And so we have the earthly type, and it represents the sanctuary in heaven. And so now you have the Israelites journeying, and so the first thing they come to is the altar of burnt offerings. Now, by the way, this whole tabernacle service is the progress of the Christian life. It truly is. It's done in such a way. It's a progress of the Christian journey, the Christian journey. So the first thing we come to realize is our need for who? A Savior. Our need for Jesus. And so the very first thing that comes up is the altar of burnt offerings. And this really is the graphic symbol and process that symbolizes who? Jesus. That he would come and die on the cross for our sins. That is where the innocent lamb was laid and sacrificed for you and I. Now the moment you leave, the priest would leave that. He would come to what? He would come to the, the lever where the water was, right? What is that symbolic of in our Christian journey? So the very first thing we realize is our need for Jesus. We accept Jesus into our heart, and then what's usually the next step in the Christian journey? Baptism. And so this symbolized baptism. The priest would come, and he'd wash his hands and his feet. Now, it's interesting. It's the same thing Jesus told his disciples in the New Testament. When Peter, no, no, don't wash me. Don't wash, if, unless, wash all of me. And Jesus is referring back. He says, well, if you've already been bathed, you've already been baptized, and this is a symbol of a rededication, a rebaptism. And so this process is symbolic of the baptism process. That once we recognize that Jesus can't wait to be part of our lives, we then say, I want to be baptized. Die to my old self and come back new, representing what Jesus did. Well, then after the priest came to that, he walked into the holy place. And what was there? To the right, as soon as he came, you saw the, uh, the table of showbread. Who does the bread represent? The bread of life. Jesus. Jesus. And you know what's interesting is every Sabbath... Those were replaced with fresh bread. Replaced with brand new fresh bread. And, uh, and so it symbolizes, again, the body of Jesus Christ and the fact that he wants to nourish us, to grow us, to feed us, to provide for us. It's all symbolic of who he is. So that's to the right. So if you were the priest, you'd walk in, you would see the, the, the bread to the right, the show bread. What would be to your left? Light. The labra, the candles, all right, seven. Now, ultimately, it was off of one. So literally, the, there was one main candle and then three off to the side, representing Jesus as the light of the world, of the light of the world. Now, those candles burnt with oil. Who do you think the oil represents? Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Every single thing, and just for the sake of time, every single thing represents Jesus and the work of salvation. That, matter of fact, one of the very first places that we have the, a messianic prophecy is in the very Garden of Eden, right? In Genesis, Genesis 2, where he said the, the, the Messiah would come from the seed of what? A woman. And so the very thing was prophesied from the very beginning. Now let's talk a little bit about the probability of it all. If every single thing represents Jesus in the Old Testament, let's talk a little bit about this miracle of probability. There's a professor, and again, I, I, I beg that it has nothing to do with luck. There's a professor that did a study from Westmont College. His name was Peter Stoner, and he calculated that the probability of one man fulfilling the major prophecies he made concerning the Messiah were pretty improbable. Matter of fact, he only took eight of them. There are about, um, I think there are 48 prophecies, messianic prophecies, that deal with the Messiah coming. So he took eight of them, and this is what he says. So let's take, he took Micah 5, 2, which states that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. Okay? That was one of the, the, uh, the prophecies. So he took that one, and he had over 600 students doing all of these studies throughout this time. 
And so he took those, and he looked at them all, and he came to the conclusion that this is what the probability would be. If one man could fulfill all eight of those prophecies, this is the probability. After examining only eight of the different ones, they estimated that the chance of one man fulfilling all eight prophecies was one in uh, to the uh, one of the the tenth to the seventeenth power. Okay, now that number, just to give you, I'm not very good at math, but when it comes to those figures, that would mean seventeen zeros. Seventeen zeros. How many how many zeros are in a million? Six. Okay, six zeros. So this is a number that has 17 zeros. And that's only one, that's only eight. All right? So here's how he defined it in the study. So suppose that we took 10 to the 17th power of silver dollars and we laid them on the face of Texas. So we took those silver dollars and we laid them all out across the state of Texas. They would cover the state two feet deep. Silver dollars, two feet deep. Okay? Now mark one of those silver dollars with a special mark. Stir the whole mess thoroughly all over the state. Blindfold a man and tell him that he can travel as far as he wishes, but he must pick the one silver dollar and say that this is the right one. So now you have somebody blindfolded going all over Texas trying to pick the one that is the right one. What chances would we have getting the right one? Just the same chances that the prophets would have had the writings of these eight prophecies and having them all come true in one man for their day to the present time. Now keep in mind, that's one of eight that we just looked at. There are over 48 prophecies, messianic prophecies, that Jesus Christ fulfills. Luck has nothing to do with it. God had a plan, and he was so focused on restoring humanity, that Jesus came to this earth to fulfill those prophecies because he is so longing to be in a relationship with you, to restore us to the way it was. He allowed nothing to get in the way. Me, on the other hand, I allow everything to get in the way. One of those things in the uh, sanctuary service that the high priest wore, by the way, who represents the high priest, Jesus. Hebrews talks all throughout there that he is the high priest. And one of the things that the high priest would be wearing would be this thing um, called uh, an ephod. He would put that on, and then on top of that would be the, uh, the, the, the um, breastplate. Now on that, there were two, two stones, the urim and the thermum. I'm probably pronouncing them wrong. But here's what they would do. They would light up. And so, let's take, for instance, David. David wasn't sure which direction to go many times in life, but he knew who to ask. He knew who to turn to. And so, before he would do something, he would go and he would ask the priest to come, wear those things, and then he would ask God the questions. Should I go out and fight? Should I go out and fight? And if the one lit up, that meant yes. If the other one lit up, it meant no. And then he would ask for a, 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 a different question. Well, Will we be victorious? One would light up, the other one light up. And so almost every situation that David would face, he would go to God for guidance. Amen? And I think the danger has come so many times in life that when we are in the middle of something, who do we typically turn to for answers? Ourselves. Others. And usually we go to God as the what resort? The last resort. The last resort. Jesus let nothing get in the way of him meeting the needs. Now to me, that means that God is the defier of all odds. I don't know what you're struggling with today, but God is an amazing God. He defies odds. It was prophesied that he would come. Again, we only looked at one prophecy there are 48 of them. And the probability of one man meeting those was impossible, pretty much. But aren't you grateful today that with God all things are possible? So I don't know what you're going through. I don't know the struggles. But you have a God at your disposal who can't wait 
to journey with you that has all the answers you need. All the answers you need. But all we have to do is to go to Him for guidance. We need to pause and go to Him for guidance. Like David, should I do this, God? Now, the amazing thing about that is in the Old Testament, that's how they dealt and got answers. But because we have a high priest that sympathizes with us, we now can go boldly before the throne of God. Because of what Jesus did, he has given us this hope that we too can come. In the children's story, we said that all good and perfect gifts come from the Father above. He wants to bestow guidance to us. He wants to bestow good gifts to us. He has given us the greatest gift ever in his son, Jesus Christ. And he wants Jesus to be part of each and every one of our daily lives. Now, I got to tell you, we're in a, we have a tendency. It's called busyness. How many of you suffer with busyness? I suffer with busyness. Matter of fact, I'll be completely honest with you. I have probably come close to burning out in ministry three times because of busyness. And I noticed I was getting close not too long ago when I would get on Facebook and I was just so overwhelmed by the craziness that's on Facebook, the craziness that's going on around us, that I finally realized that I was pulling away. And usually pulling away is my first sign of burnout. When I begin to pull away and stop these things. Because, and here's what's been happening. Oftentimes in ministry, guess who we rely on? Our own abilities, our own strengths, our own endeavors. And there's this tendency in ministry, not, not everybody suffers with this, but it's called the Messiah complex. We try so hard in ministry to be there for everybody. And oftentimes we tend to become more of a Martha than a Mary. And we sit, instead of sitting at our Savior's feet, we're busy doing the work of the kingdom, trying to do this and trying to do that and trying to help and trying to please everybody. And it got to the point where I recognized, man, i got to slow things up. i got to be just as intentional as Jesus was. Jesus allowed nothing to get in the way of his mission to come and redeem humanity. He came to redeem us all. And so what I want to challenge us with uh, these next few weeks is I want to begin journeying with you on something that I've started called Purpose Driven Life. And I truly believe that there is a great strength in looking at purpose versus program or activity. Because there's this tendency to say, well, as long as I'm doing a lot, I must be doing a lot of good stuff. But that doesn't always equate. Sure, you, you can do a lot, and there could be a lot of good things, but what is being sacrificed in the midterm as you're doing the busyness? All right? So um, I began looking at this book called Purpose Driven Life, and I know it's been out there for a very long time, but it's a 40-day challenge to myself, and I would love to open it up to you as well. Just get the book. I'm sure the ABC can order them, you know, in bulk if need be. But you get this book, and it begins with the most basic. You were created for a purpose. See, I think so many times we are trying to stay so busy because it's in the busyness. We try to, we start to feel like, well, I'm valued. I'm important. You know, I am busy, so therefore, things must be going well. But that's not the case. You were created for a specific purpose. In Jeremiah 29, it says that God has a plan for you. Now, he was talking to a group of exiles who thought that they had been forgotten about. But God has a plan for each one of us. And what I want to challenge you to do is I want to challenge you to become purpose-driven. Purpose-driven. And I want to praise God for something really important. I believe that this church is purpose-driven. I believe it. Everything we try to do, we talk about. Worship committee. Again, it is not by chance that we had all these young children involved in today's service. Church leaders and parents and people have recognized we want this church to be about our children, to be about all generations. 
And this church is actively trying to get you involved with a purpose, with a ministry. So whose fault will it be if you don't get involved? Your, our own faults. This church is very purpose-driven. We need you. God needs you to get involved. Whether it's part of the uh, greeting teams, whether it's part of the prayer warriors, there are tons of ministries that you can be involved with. Now I caution you. Again, we don't want to be program-driven. We want to be purpose-driven like Jesus was. Like Jesus was. Again, I'm so proud of this church. And today I want to challenge each and every one of you. Will you become purpose-driven for the kingdom of God? Will you become purpose-driven for the kingdom of God? Now only God can define what that may look like. Only God can define and affirm you. Maybe what you're already doing right now is part of that purpose. Only God can convict us if we're being more like a Martha or a Mary. The other day, um, <clears throat> I was with a group of uh, young men, and they had got so tired of playing church. You know what I mean by playing church? They had just come. It's like they were punching in this uh, spiritual time clock, per se. They would just come, check in, and they came to me and they said, you know, we're not getting really anything out of church. And I said, well, why are you coming to church? Well, we're coming because we feel we have to. <laughs> I said, well, there's part of the problem. Coming to church is part of an experience, part of a growing relationship with a God that is so madly in love with you. And when you come to church, you have an opportunity to come together as corporate worshipers, talking about how God has been moving in and through your lives. And so I said, do you believe that God is real and active? We know He is. We know He is. And I said, well, then when was the last time you worshipped Him like He was? Now, it's the moment I said that, guess what happened in my own heart? <laughs> I recognized that I, too, had been so busy coming to church that I, too, forgot the most important aspect of church, and that was to come and worship God, to praise Him for the good things, the good and perfect gifts that He's given us. And so when they left, we talked and we committed to each other. Let's make sure that we're holding each other accountable to be coming to church for the right reasons. Now, you can come to church for whatever reasons, they said. And I said, I agree. But they said, we want to come to church as an expression of what God has been doing in and through our lives. And when we come to church to do corporate worship, we want to lift and encourage each other up and share what God has been doing. Why? Because we have a God that defies all odds. Again, I don't, it doesn't matter to God what you're going with. He is faithful and just to meet your needs, to grow you, to strengthen you, to challenge you, to affirm you. That is the God I serve. Is that the God you serve? The God you want to follow? God is the defier of odds. And what we have to remember is we need to remember to turn to Him in all aspects of our journey. Not just when we need Him, but recognize that He's paid it all. He's taken care of all of our needs. And all we need to do is turn to Him and ask that he would continue to lead and grow us. Amen?